presentation, uh, but firstly, I would like to introduce myself. Okay, my name is Alisa Agustiana, uh, 102 17107. I'm for the, from the Department of Physics, Bandung Institute of Technology. Um, now, I would like to uh, present my project. It is about the gamma structure of nanoparticle as a detector for heavy metal, copper, and mercury. Firstly, I would like to uh, explain my, the background of this research. Uh, in this modern era, heavy metals pollute is one of the interesting for living things. Of course, for us, because it is not just uh, impact on humans who consume the water, but it can also contaminate the vital in these waters, which may be consumed by humans. So it will be dangerous if we not uh, pay attention more for heavy metal. Okay, uh, the outline that I will present for today is about the research itself, the experiment method, data, and conclusion. Yes, uh, now I would like to explain the uh, about the research itself. Uh, as a research in general, um, my research have some purpose, uh, purposes. Uh, there are to determine the geometric structure of nanoparticles to, de to detect heavy metal particles contained in water and then determine the type of materials that uh, that is most suitable for detecting heavy metals in water and then to, determ to determine the parameters that can be used as the reference for whether or not heavy metals are found in an area of water. And then also as research in general, uh, my research also have limitation because um, some uh, some things. The limitations are my research is not that is only done by simulation, so that means the research is not uh, experiment directly, but it just done by simulation. And then the method that I use for this uh, research is finite element method. And the geometric that I use for this simulation shape is a square. I'm not using another uh, shape for the simulation. And then the data that I will get, I'll, I will get from this research, it is skinned up, heat losses, refractive index, and relative permittivity. And it is one of one example of the data that I get from the simulation. And Okay, now uh, I would like to try uh, the experiment method. Um, for experiment method, I before I use uh, finite element method, and the, the application that I use for uh, done my simu the simulation is using Comsol. Now, uh, in Comsol itself, uh, firstly I have to define some parameters in parameter global and choose geometry to done to do the simulation. And then, of course, I have to input mesh. Mesh is the smallest part for get our geometry uh, to do simulation. And then uh, choose shape function and then choose stiffness matrix. And then input Helmholtz equation because I use Helmholtz equation for then for do this uh, simulation. And after that, I can process the, the program. Um, and if we get error more than one person, we have to back to mess and try uh, running the program, uh, re-running the program. But if the error uh, lower than one person, uh, the program will plot some data that we already mentioned before. And now this is some example of data that I have got from uh, the simulation but it is just the person radius for silver. Okay, now is the data that I have already got. Um, this is skin that uh, water. Uh, so sorry, uh, before, because I'm not, I haven't done, I haven't, uh, I step i haven't do analyze step for this in my final project but i'll try to 
So I explain the data, just uh, use qualitative, just qualitative. Now, uh, first data is blood uh, skin depth silver. Um, uh, as we know, skin depth is uh, skin depth uh, usually represent how deep penetration of the electromagnetic wave in material. So from this curve, we can see uh, that the curve tell us uh, uh, if the skin depth um, in decrease uh, exponentially uh, from the wavelength for until seven uh, nanometer, and then. Uh, and then the second data that is about heat losses, heat heat losses, and as we know also, heat losses is uh, the net of heat trough uh, transfer for from warmer to cooler areas. So we can see from the bigger radius and the lower radius that I put for this simulation. Uh, will have their own characterization that will that will shown in this uh, pictures pictures. And then the third data that I got from the simulation is refractive index. Now, uh, the but for the refractive index, I will uh, I will get imaginary part and real part. Why it happened? Because I use a uh, Helmholtz equation, so it will contain imaginary part and uh, real part. So from this data, we can see um, the imaginary imaginary part will uh, shown the that uh, the data trend it is decrease uh, linearly, and for index. Uh, refractive index in real part it will shown like uh, decrease at the first and increase uh, linearly at the end from 0.5 buff length and the last data that I got from the simulation is uh, relative permittivity and also for uh, relative permittivity I, uh, I got uh, imaginary part and real part from this work, we can see that uh, permittivity and imaginary part uh, looks like the same trend yeah it is decreased limit linearly and but the number for uh, relative permittivity it's different because the imaginary part is just uh, start from minus 0.5 to minus 1.5 and the uh, real, relative permittivity in real part, it start from uh, minus two until minus 20. And uh, after that, I have some conclusion. This is the best geometry structure of nanoparticles the type of material to detect heavy metal particles and the parameters that can be used as a reference for whether or not heavy metals are found in water can be found by the data in code it's skin up, hit lizard refractive index, and also relative permittivity. So sorry, I'm not put it here yet. And um for so um and I'm sorry too because the type of material um, that I the simulation I cannot um, show the data here because I think it is not enough. We have no time for it to do it. Okay, maybe that's all from my presentation. And thank you for your nice attention, guys. And any question? Okay, thank you, Alice, for uh, giving a broad presentation related to the geometry structure of nanoparticles. So we have time for three questions from the audience. Sir, I want to ask, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, Alice, for the presentation. I want to ask about the skin depth. Can you go back to the skin depth slide? Okay. Okay, this one. 
So I I want to confirm that in the vertical axis there is times 10 to power of minus eight, and then the unit of the skin depth is nanometer. Is it true or? Ah, uh, so sorry. How about it? Because I <laughs> okay, think so sorry. it's very small. If like that, I think <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mas Martin, for the confirmation. Yeah, I actually for skin depth we use nanometer, but uh, actually this one is concrete nanometer also. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for correction, Martin. So the value of uh, skin depth is confirmed to be on nanometer. Um, for this because we have cross uh, ten eight there, so it is uh, must be matter, Na okay. nanometer again. Okay, because uh, the reactor itself, uh, the size will be uh, in meters, so it is. Uh, uh, normal to have a, a skin depth in also in the unit of meter. Okay, uh, one other question for Alice. Yes. I have a question, sir, for Alice. Yes, go um, ahead. Alice, um, I want to ask about this. You said you uh, analyze this with console, right? So um, do you use entirely the program or are you also um, make your uh, custom code to, to that program? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christopher, for the question. Uh, actually, for this program, I already make it a program because it is take a long time for open it. And so sorry, maybe we can uh, show another time, yeah? Because uh, there is no. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Actually, uh, for this plotting, I'm not use a console itself because comes I because I just extract the data from the console and plot it together, become some graphic to be one uh, picture with a MATLAB. Yes, I extract the data first in console like that. Okay, oh, okay. so first of all, I cannot show you the program yet. Yes, uh, that's that's all right. We we don't have many much time. Uh, thank you very yes. much, Alice, for your explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Christopher. So, okay. are you using uh Comsol MATLAB uh instead of just using Comsol, right? Ah, uh, yes, Mister, because uh the MATLAB I just use for uh make the plot uh to combine each graphic to be one graphic, to be one picture, just mm, it. Okay. okay, because, uh, uh, yeah, because console itself could not produce EPS or JPEG uh, figure, so that uh, for us to uh, develop some outputs uh, from console, mm -hmm. we basically uh, transfer or we connect console with MATLAB so that, uh, so that we could generate uh, figures and also graph or tomogram that is uh, computed from console with the visualization uh, using MATLAB. And from there, we can save it as JPEG or PDF or uh, EPS, depending on our, uh, depending on our uh, uh, task whether we want to use it in the presentation paper or uh, in a scientific paper. Okay, thank you, Alice, uh, yeah, thank okay. you for the presentation. Uh, okay, thank so you, by that, we are going to move on to the second presenter of the day, which is Edgar Rafi Manjo. Uh, present, sir. Yes. Hello, sir. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, without further ado, I would like Amanzo to start the presentation. Okay, please read. Oke, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam Good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Edgar Rafi Manzo, Mata Kusuma. And first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Hari Hardika for giving me the opportunity to present my paper research, which is titled The Analysis of Stock Index Prediction Using Support Vector Regression, a Case Study on IDX Composite. So, Before I get into the body of the presentation, I would like to explain briefly the outline for today's presentation. So first, I would like to discuss the introduction, why I did this research, what's the background of it, how I formulate the problem, and from that, how I uh, decide the objectives of the research, and lastly, how or what the scope of the research is. And secondly, I will discuss the literature review, the theory, the definition of the stock index uh, and the support vector regression. And third, I will discuss the algorithm or simply the workflow of the research. And uh, finally, I will discuss the result of the research and the summary and the further improvements if we want to continue this research. So the background, why I did this research. Uh, as we all know, stock is one of the most popular investment instrument of investment since, since it, it can provide huge capital gain. Now, what exactly is capital gain? Capital gain is the difference between the selling price and the buying price. So ideally, we want to buy as low as possible and sell as high as possible. But this is hard to do since there are no exact equation that can predict this. Then no mathematical equation that can predict the stock prices uh, correctly. And investors, traditionally would use technical indicators to guide their investments. These technical indicators include things such as uh, simple moving averages, exponential moving averages, or as we can see on the figure here, uh, MACD, MACD indicators, RSI indicators, WACC distribution. But this Analyzing these graphs can be quite difficult for new investors. So uh, the idea is to implement machine learning. So machine learning can automate this process for investors and hopefully can use this to guide their investment. Uh, so the formulation of the problem, uh, how can we help investors guide their investment using machine learning for predicting the future IDX composite, or as we know it, IHSG rates. rates. And secondly, uh, how does the model perform in predicting? And will it be feasible to use uh, to guide when or where we should invest our money? Uh, from there, the, the objective of the research Uh, first, we apply the support vector regression to predict the future prices of the Jakarta Composite Index and IHSG rates using the model we built. And lastly, we will measure the performance of the model using metrics such as R squared and root mean squared error as evaluation metrics. And lastly, the scope of the research. So the prediction is produced by applying and the prediction will be compared to the actual prices from yeah, we obtained from yahoofinance.com. The data uh, used is obtained from yahoofinance.com from 8th December 2019 to 27th. November 2020. 
and for this research the inputs are x values is the closing price on the nth day and the output or the y value is the price on the n plus one day we also vary parameters for for python tree uh, Now for the brief definition of stock index. Stock index is a uh, Is it lost? Is Edgar's connection lost? It is computed from the main. Yes, sir. I think we lost. Okay, continue. Continue. Hello, sir. Can you hear my voice? Yes, yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I will start again from the theory of the stock index. But I think the, the screen share is is lost, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you for letting me know, Christopher. Uh, now can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, you have five minutes to conclude. Okay. Uh, stock index is a subset of stock market and it is computed from the mean of selected stocks and in case for ehsg it is computed from the mean of every investment instrument listed on indonesia's stock exchange it is used for uh, to help investors calculate the market performance to guide as i said before their investment and for the support vector regression algorithm the support vector regression is formulated as we are trying to minimize the square of the norm of the weight vector divided by two with these constraints, these two constraints. Uh, and this formulation won't work for all data points. We are taking into account the possibility of errors that are higher than epsilon. And we will formulate it like this. We will introduce a penalty number for penalty number parameter called C and select variables. And now the constraints uh, look like this. And support vectors are data points that are located exactly on or outside the, de the decision boundary. This is uh, the visualization of the SVR. So uh, support vectors are data points that are on exactly or outside, but within the error uh, psi. Uh, and these are the support vectors. And data points that are in the error tolerance will be treated as zeros. For the dual formulation, the optimization problem for SVR is formulated as this term right here with these constraints uh, because the limited time I will not discuss this formula and the final regression function is formulated as fx equals the sum of the Lagrange multiplier alpha i minus alpha i times the dot product of the input plus the bias. Now the algorithm uh, so firstly, we the step is called the data acquisition, where we gather the data from the website, and it will come in tabular format with the opening price, highest price, lowest price, and closing price columns. And in the data preparation, we will process the data. We will extract the features we want to use, and in this case, it is the closing price. And we will also create uh, an output 
or Y column, the N plus one day price. And after that, we will feed the data to our model, which is the SVR, uh, which would be that SVR. And after that, we will evaluate the performance our, of our model. And if it, if it is not performing to our standards, we will tune the parameters as said before in the scope of the research. And we will reiterate until the model gives a satisfactory performance. And the best model will be deployed and monitored. So this is the result for the research. So we will we vary the hyperparameters, such the linear, the kernel function, the penalty hyperparameters, and the epsilon hyperparameters. And the best, the best result is produced using the model with the hyperparameters c equals 10, epsilon equals 1, and using the linear kernel function. And as we can see on the figure on the right, we can see that the model cannot exactly predict the price of the EHSG stock index, but it gives a good agreement on the direction of the growth of the stock index. We can see when it actually goes up, the prediction goes up. When it goes down, it also goes down for uh, five working days prediction. The best model gave an accuracy R squared of 0 0.902 and a root mean squared error of 37.93. So where do we go from here? For, our, for the next research, we can use macro or microeconomic indicators as inputs. These economic indicators can be things such as interest rates, GDP, or consumer price index. And second, we can do sentiment or news analysis since news can affect the performance of stocks. And third, we can use more data points to fit to our model and produce a more robust model. Uh, this is the citations for the works I've referenced it. I've referenced it during the research. And that's all. Thank you. That's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We have time for one question for Edgar. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Please? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Edgar, for the presentation. It's pretty interesting. So, I want to ask you, what do you think about SVM machine learning? What do you think is the advantage of SVM over other machine learning method for predicting stock price? Oh, okay, thank you, Kavin, for the question. And for me, the advantage of using SVM algorithm to predict stock prices is because the ability of the SVM to uh, uh, notice the if there are any nonlinear tendencies of the data, of the data points, since uh, in stock prices that are there are uh, many fluctuations that make the uh, graph uh, goes up and down like that. I think that's the advantage. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and also Edgar for giving a brief explanation related to the uh, analysis of the stock prices using Super Factor Machine. Uh, so, uh, thank you for uh, Edgar. And okay. therefore, we're moving on to the third presenter, which is Christopher. So, I'm going to ask Edgar to turn of the screen okay. share so that uh, Christopher can share. All right. Um, first of all, is my voice clear there? 
and my screen is uh, on i use uh, yes. my my video to um to uh, make this presentation so let's start from the beginning um so um hello any everybody hello sir um let me introduce myself again uh, my name is christopher jaya 102 um zero um and i am and i am from kaka fnb um, from the Department of Physics in FMIPA. And in this very occasion, I will uh, try to uh, explain what I uh, have been researched for this past year. It's a simple one-dimensional beta voltage uh, calculation. I'm sorry, uh, Christopher, yes. I yes. interrupt. Uh, well, I think I can see your video. Maybe right. if another person have uh, can see it, maybe it's only my uh, my uh mungkin okay my handphone device all oh, right Maybe my right, device. right 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 okay i will use a tradition more traditional ways to present it then um how do i use that screen sharing oh maybe if I... you can uh if you uh maybe have difficult maybe you can do that no no okay, that's, that's fine, fine. Okay. that's fine Good something now. like that okay um let's then we continue um, first, this is the outline of presentation. First, I want to explain, uh, I want to tell the introduction about what I've been studied and then the theory behind it and then some um, examples of the calculations uh, from the theory that uh, was done by uh, other researchers. And by the way, the other researchers' uh, papers is my main reference, so I will explain it to you. And then in the last part, I, I, will, uh, I will tell you the uh, summary of this presentation. First of all, what is beta voltage cells? Um, beta voltage cells, comes from two words. It's come from beta and voltage. The beta is a kind of particle that comes from um, nuclear decay. If you remember about decay, uh, so uh, the nuclei inside, inside atom can transform from one form into another form and then spitting out um, many kind of particles, for example, alpha, beta, or gamma. Um, and in this case, uh, the beta is uh, refers to the beta particle, and the voltage is uh, it's about the electricity production. So, if you ever heard about photovoltaic cells or uh, the solar cells, uh, well, it's device that uh, use photo to make electricity. Uh, but in the beta voltage case, uh, we use beta particle to make beta. Uh, beta voltage cells. The history is um, this is not really an, uh, an old technology because it's just it's not even 100 years old yet, but uh, it's not really that new either. So, uh, first, uh, a person named Paul Rapaport from Radio Corporation of America report uh, the, the beta voltage effects. Um, in 1953, and then L.C. Olsen uh, did the calculation. Um, he analyzed several models of beta voltage cell from his uh, laboratory. And then since then, several designs and analysis has been proposed and calculated. So uh, throughout the years, uh, there's uh, two kinds of research, research in beta voltage cells. Uh, the, the, in, in the first category, they build the device and then they do direct measurements to that device. And in another group, they try to simulate and calculate it analytically and com with, with computer also. Now, why is this F interesting? Why there's so many paper about this? Well, it can generate electricity with high energy density, a long lifetime. It's small, it's compact. Um, it can directly convert decay energy into electricity. So uh, it, it, it theoretically can gain high efficiency, but we will see later. And then uh, it has a negligent I environmental think effect. Microphone is... Yes, sir. Microphone? Oh I think God. your microphone is, is not working. I oh. cannot hear your voice. Oh, God. Um, OK, now it's, now it's OK. Okay, now it's okay. 
I don't know why. Perhaps the okay. So uh, this is interesting because of um, these five things. I um, that I quote from um, papers by Zhuo Guo um, and at all in 2013. And the possible application are the pacemakers and military sensors and then GPS sensors. How it works then? Okay, um, so this is the simple one dimensional schematic diagram of beta photic battery. Um, well, the, the whole <laughs> the whole order is wrong, so I will just give it a hand. So there are some isotopes that can emit beta particles. Let's say nickel 63, strontium 90, promethium 147. They can emit beta particles. And these particles can interact with electrons and different materials. For example, this is the beta source. And if it goes through some kind of materials, it will do, it will interact. Uh, first due to red, Rutherford scattering and second due to bram lung interaction. And if beta particle interacts, they will generate uh, electron hole pairs. What is electron hole pairs? So, uh, electron hole pairs is uh, basically the excitation of the materials. When, uh, when a semiconductor excitates, it will uh, kick the electron to higher energy and then it will left a hole. And then that the, the electron and the hole will um, diffuse. Um, and it will diffuse to the depression region, you know, the middle part uh, between the PN junction. If we have two kind of semiconductor, um, and then we uh, try to uh, make them close, and then when it goes to the depression region, the voltage difference will increase. How it diffuses is according to the minority carrier diffusion equation. Meanwhile, beta particles will with lose. Uh, will lose some of its energy, I'm sorry for the typo there, as it went through the medium. How much is energy loss per how much it has gone is called stopping power. So um, let's say you take the element of um, the X uh, from X, X. It's, 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 it's basically the length. Um, and then how many energy loss there, loss there can be explained with stopping power. Okay, uh, there's two kind of stopping power, the ionization and bram lung but the bram lung aka the, the thing that produces X-ray with bram lung interaction, is so small compared to the ionization stopping power. Now, um, what is MCDE? This is the equation. Uh, it's a or second order uh, ordinary differential equation. And the GX contains the stopping power uh, of the beta inside the materials. This is for the P type, um, and this is for the N type, and for the depletion region because it has very strong um, um, electric field. We assume that the pairs are all corrected. After MCD is solved, we then um, use everything that we got and plug it to the uh, ideal semiconductor equation. Yeah, this is. The ISC is uh, for uh, the current, the short circuit current, the open circuit voltage, the Pmax is this, the field factor is just uh, the quality of how much energy, uh, how much power can you harness from the semiconductor junction. And then this is uh, the classic symbol for efficiency. Usually we uh, times it with 100%. Now, um, for the example, um, I use this is this is my main reference by the way, electrical study with strontium 90 source. In this calculation, uh, the researchers only assume that the trajectory of the particle is one dimensional and the semiconductor is ideal with only count, uh, stopping power, MCDE, and the ideal semiconductor equations. And this is the, the parameter of semiconductors. This is the numbers, but basically it's it's like what you call a quail lapis in Bahasa Indonesia. It, it built up layers on layers and it is pretty thin only uh, uh, this is this is this is really really thin in 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 the in the micrometer order so yeah this is this is very small and very thin uh, but it can still produce electricity for a very very long time now this paper compare nine, uh, nickel 63 and strontium 90 as the cell source it's also use another reference that i also use um, 
for the Nickel 63 and they and 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 Mr. Hastama and Mr. Waris. Uh, by the way, you know Mr. Waris, they are our lecturers. Uh, they 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 uh, calculate for the strontium 90 as the source for the beta uh, voltaic cells, and um, they uh, use two kinds of isotopes. Uh, I mean, uh, in the term of the activity first uh, 0.25 millicurie and then uh, one millicurie and as you can see uh, the field factor is better for the strontium 90 right uh, compared to the uh, nickel 63 but the efficiency oh they are so poor so this is must be worse than right but actually not why because they use the same parameters and apparently, um, you different the, these parameters can only optimize for one type of source. If you use the, another type of source, you need to re-optimize the parameter so the efficiency will gain the max its maximum level. So yeah, it's not optimized. So the conclusion, uh, first, there's still so much research to do regarding this technology. For example, what if we optimize the parameters, then perhaps we can gain a higher efficiency. Uh, we can also try to calculate it with different materials, different calculation methods, different geometry, etc. And second, also looks weak and inefficient because of its longevity and small size, because again, it's less than 2%. Uh, beta photic cells can be used to power really small remote devices for a really long time, as long as it's not, uh, it's not consumed big power. And this is what I basically are, uh, what I am doing right now. So um, I try to use computer to calculate some beta voltage parameters with these steps. First, we generate the beta particles, and then we generate the stopping power. We solve the MCDE and calculating its power and efficiency. Unfortunately, uh, I'm still stuck in this in, in the third step, so I cannot yet tell you uh, my results, but. I'm very optimistic about it. Then to make it more realistic, we can also include effects that happen in the cells. For example, the backscattering effect, the surface recombination effect, the medium damage to, due to particle interaction. We can also uh, try to calculate with higher dimension, etc. cetera. Um, and also we can optimize some design, of course. So yeah, um, I'm, uh, that's all. Thank you for um, your participation. Um, that's all from me, thank you. Okay, thank you, Christopher. We right. have time for two or three questions from the audience. Uh, can I ask a question, yes. please? All right. Okay. So uh, you mentioned that this uh, this battery will last a really long time, right? right. So uh, how long do you think it will last? And do you think it could be improved further, perhaps? Okay, uh, good question. So um, from what I read from uh, several sources that I've, unfortunately I don't put it there because I, I am afraid uh, I'll um, take too much time to explain that. Um, it can, it, it will last between 10 uh, to 20 years. With with uh with almost same quality from when the first when it first uh, turned on. So basically, uh, imagine a pacemaker uh, with beta photic cells. It can do um, as we can we do as well for ten years or almost twenty years. That's what that's what I uh, I get there from another um, source. So yeah, more than ten years. Oh, so that's really long. I think some people would be very interested in that application, right? Right, and um, also the the uh, its age is uh, is is directly linked to the half times of the isotope itself. You know uh, the terms half life. The longer the half time, the longer the beta photic cell is. Uh, its life is so yeah, and and most of and there's so many isotopes with with a really, really long half time, so. Uh, thank you, Christoph, for answering me. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Sorry if I'm not 
Okay, we have time for one quick question, if there's any. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask, sir? Yes. Of course, Edgar. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christo, for giving the presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. For someone with little to no knowledge on this field of study, can you uh, explain the reason why uh, Mr. Waris and Rahastama chose nickel and strontium as the research objects while and not any other uh, isotopes is is there any advantages to choosing those two is isotopes uh, that's all thank you oh yes um actually oh yeah hati -hati, bi, di jalan, bi. yeah okay um, i'm sorry for the interruption so um I've asked that to Mr. Waris, why you pick a uh, nickel 63 as source? And he said that it is easily obtained. Uh, well, for, uh, the, we, need to uh, we need to remind ourselves that this is a radioactive source and it is pretty sensitive when we talk about radioactive source. And the nickel 63 is pretty easy to obtain. You just need to put uh, regular nickels into uh, some reactors. And uh, behind ITB, there's button with uh, with reactors. You can just put nickels there, um, and then irradiate it to make it uh, more active, to make it more radioactive. And then you got uh, nickel sixty three. So uh, there's another potent, more potent source, but it it's harder to obtain. So uh, that's why. Uh, they choose a nickel 63 and then the strontium 90 because uh, if i'm not wrong strontium 90 is also easier to obtain even though if we talk about the energy density the promethium 147 is better but it's harder to get okay thank okay, you th christo yeah thank you christopher and uh, Edgar. thank you uh, we are going to move on to our fourth presenter which is uh, martin adrian Okay, so uh, I'm just going to remind everybody to uh, sign up for the uh, attendance list as usual on SIX. And also don't forget to fill in the presenter assessment sheet that I already gave you this morning. And then, um, okay, so is it Martin ready for his talk? Uh, yes, sir. Can I okay. Start? Okay, okay, good morning. Everybody ready, you may start your presentation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Adrian. Now I will tell you about my research, which title is Mobile Monitoring Device to Measure PM 2.5 Concentration in Bandung. So first, I will tell you the background story about this research. Air pollution is a problem that is faced globally around the world. Last time, we heard about the fire that occur in oil refinery of Pertamina and that cause a lot of smoke. If the smoke is inhaled by human or animal, it can cause a serious health problem, especially a respiratory disease. Besides rarely occasion like fire that occur every day, when we do activity in the city, we also expose to the air pollution. The air pollution comes from the vehicle, for example. So we need an air quality information so we can take preventive measures to reduce the risk of air pollution exposure. We can get the air quality information from a fixed station. This is an example of fixed station that measure some of air pollution components such as gas or particulate matter. But the problem is the fixed station only measure the surrounding air. If we want to know more about the air pollution in the city, we need to install many of big stations. Because of that, there may be a limitation on the budget. So the mobile monitoring method can be a solution to the problem to cover more area. Particulate matter is a suspended solid or liquid substance in the air. It is usually categorized by the diameter. For example, PM 2.5 is for the particle with diameter less than 5 to 0.5 micrometer. 
if PM2.5 is inhaled, it can cause disease. Particulate matter comes from different sources, such as natural source from pollen, dust, or from anthropogenic sources, which is from human activity, like combustion or the heat. Next, mobile monitoring is a method to measure something in moving location. So the instrument should be a portable one or it can be carried around. The measurement is done in moving vehicle or the instrument is carried around by hand or by bicycle. Because the measurement is in moving object, so it can increase the granularity of the spatial data. Besides that, the device can get closer distance to the PM source, such as in this picture is a truck. We can get closer to the truck if it is a mobile monitoring device. A mobile monitoring device can also be equipped with sensors according to our needs. The previous study about the mobile monitoring is they are using a separate instrument. It also done in various mode of transportation such as bus, car, bicycle. Uh, it also been done in public transportation such as using taxis or bus. And the place where the research is in China, Canada, and Hong Kong. Next, this research aim is to design the measurement instrument and using a low cost sensor and the instrument can provide a real time measurement data. This research also focuses on rush hour time, which is in the morning and afternoon. And it, uh, there is two micro environment within the study, which is a residential area and also the road. So this is the design of the system of mobile monitoring device. The first one is the monitoring instrument, which consists of microcontroller equipped with low-cost PM sensor in the type of HPMA and the temperature and humidity sensor. The measurement instrument is connected to the smartphone through a gateway. The gateway is a Wi-Fi connection. Uh, in the smartphone, the Android application is made to get the GPS data to get the location, and the application uh, save the data from the measurement instrument to the internal storage. The smartphone also send the measurement data and location to the server via internet connection. Finally, we can see the measurement data from the website or we can download it, the data to analyze it further. This is the research area map. This is around Batu Nunggal residential area in area one. And in area two, there is a traditional market. And last one is area three, there is a toll gate. So the measurement is using a motorbike to get around this three area and also this red line is also passed by the motorcycle. After 10 days of measurement, this is the descriptive statistics of uh, mobile monitoring instrument. As we can see that it, in on the average, the on-road PM2.5 concentration is higher about 30% than in area one. Uh, we can also see that the maximum PM2.5 concentration measure is also higher than in area one. This is uh, can be caused because there is a lot of diesel truck that is passing on the road, especially around area three. So the diesel truck produce more smoke that is detected rather than a uh, usual vehicle. Next, if we visualize the data in the terms of in map, we can see like this. This is example for measurement on January the 2nd, 
2021, uh, we can see that the on road concentration in the morning in the left figure is generally higher, especially this on area three, that is a yellowish red, and rather than other road area. In the residential area, there are more commonly uh, low PM, PM 2.5 concentration. In the afternoon, all part in area one or on road, there is uh, less PM 2.5 measure than in the morning. Uh, the next one is if we calculate the distance between all measurement points to the road, it can be plot like this. So on the distance less than 700 meters to the road, there are more PM 2.5 that is higher than 70 microgram per meter cubic. On the distance larger than 700 meters, there are less uh, PM 2.5 concentration, there are more than 70 microgram per meter cubic. So for the conclusion, mobile monitoring system for PM concentration is made and the PM source mainly observed in this study is a diesel, from diesel, diesel truck, vehicle, and open fire on the side of the road. And the last one, there is higher PM concentration on road than on the residential area. I think that's all. Now I'm ready to answer your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Martin. We have time for two or three questions on this session. Uh, I have a question, sir. Yes, please. So, Martin, um, can you tell, uh, tell me how how you calibrate your measurement device? Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you for the question. So, the measurement device is, this is the picture of the prototype of the measurement device. Uh, if you see this a little of a black box like here. This is the HPMR sensor. It uses a laser and it measures the light intensity scattered by the particulate matter. Uh, and this is the microcontroller that is used. This is uh, the blue one is the Wi-Fi module to connect it to the smartphone device and the other component is just a supporting component, so the system might work. This is powered by the accumulator in the motorbike. Oh, okay. do, you, do you use um, amplifier for uh, this device? Uh, no, sir, I don't use any amplifier because the sensor output is already in the PM 2.5 concentration. So it is factory calibrated, so the amplifier is not needed for the sensor. Mm -hmm. okay. Ah, OK, oh. OK, I see. How many months do you take for uh, designing and uh, creating the device? Uh, actually, for designing, there is two phases, I think. The first one is designing the instrument. It takes about uh, one or two months. but the Android application is a little bit long, maybe around two or three months, because I need to learn to make the Android application. Mm, okay. So that it can, uh, so that you could connect it with uh, cell phones or tab in order yeah, to. Yes, okay. Because uh, in. We have when... time. Okay, yes, uh, you could continue. Uh, we can use it, uh, we can connect it to the smartphone because the smartphone has the hotspot connection. So this device is connected to the smartphone hotspot. Mm, okay, that is good. Uh, uh, we have time for one quick question, if there's any. Uh, sir, I want to ask. Yes. Uh, so my name is Johnson. Uh, I want to ask, uh, so in the uh, in the measurement, are you uh, measure uh, the particular matter uh, two point five in the uh, I think in the dry uh, day and the rainy day, 
And is there any difference uh, from uh, that point? Oh, okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, so my uh, research is focuses on the time on the afternoon and also on the morning uh, because of there may be a difference in the season, but I have not done uh, the measurement in different season. It, uh, the measurement I have been done is on December and January, and that is generally on the rainy season. But if the if there is happen to be raining on the type of the measurement, the measurement is not done because it may affect the measurement of particular paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, because I think uh, maybe there are uh, a correlation uh, between the wet, uh, I think it's like the wet road and the dry road. I think because maybe the particular method is uh, actually uh, created with, uh, because the friction between the road and maybe the vehicle. Thank you. Uh... Yes, that may be a possibility of dust generated from that, but there are also can be another source. Yeah, yeah I think this also becomes part of yeah. your uh, final project uh, research to differentiate between uh, particles that is coming from the air and also from uh, the, the human uh, interaction or um, uh, vehicle interaction on the road. Okay, okay. Uh, I guess uh, we are on time. <clears throat> we can move on to our uh, fifth presenter, which is Nazla Inaya. Thank you, Martin, for giving us a very interesting presentation. Is Nazla in the classroom? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, uh, you may start whenever you're ready. Oke, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam warahmatullah. Oke, okay. hello everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. And my name is Nadla Inaya, and I'm from Nuclear and Biophysics Scientific Group. And today I would like to present my paper, and the title is Comparative Study of Desalination Cross in PWR Reactor for the Small Territory in Indonesia. Oke, okay, next, let's move on to the outline. Oke, okay. okay. Okay, the outline is about uh, first talk about introduction, results and analysis, conclusion, references, and the last is acknowledgement. Okay, the introduction. There are three important things that I will discuss in here. First, about electricity. Yep, everyone realized that electricity is the important or fundamental thing in our life when we are. Uh, want to sleep or waking up, go to bedroom, even for study, for our phone, laptop, Wi-Fi, and other. Yes, we need electricity. Okay, or I think we need the electricity, sorry. And next about the desalination. In our mind, when we heard about the desalination word, suddenly we think about water. Uh, the desalination is the process to produce uh, fresh water from seawater, and up to 60% of the human adult body is water, according to H.H. Michael Journal of Biological Chemistry. The brain and the heart are composed of 73% water, and the lungs are about 83% uh, water. And not only for our body, but also for our daily life, such as take a bath, clean the floor, wash the dishes, or the other things that we are need water. Yes, we are need water, SMS, electricity. Okay, and the last is about the software D5.1. Software D5.1 is the open source software. 
this software is for calculating the desalination cost. So we could know what is the best uh, source for uh, uh, for to find the best price electricity and desalination. And the other for calculating hydrogen and but for this paper only for electricity and water. Why I supposed to talk about this? Because based on data from electrical statistics from the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources 2019, we found that East Nusa Tenggara or NTT and North Sulawesi or Sutra province are the lowest electrification in Indonesia around 85,84 and 89,58 respectively, uh, I mean in percent. And they have to pay the electricity in the highest price, not like us in Bandung, only 900 rupiah, uh, but they have to pay around 2,000 rupiah. So that's why we should find the best solution for solving this problem. Okay, this is only view of the software. This is the input, the input view of DIP. And this one is the comparison view of DIP, but this is only the example. But the, I'm so interested of DIP because we said uh, we could make comparison directly in DIP, like this one from scenario one, two, three, until nine. Okay, this is the core of our discussion, results and analysis. As we see in this figure, this one is about uh, the fuel, nuclear, gas, and coal. And this part, I mean steam, gas, combined, head only is about the cycle. Okay, we know from this figure, the cheapest price is coal fire head only, and the second is nuclear. Uh, Nuclear, nuclear fire head only. And the question is why the head only could be the cheapest cost or cheapest price? And if we see from the paper, the real paper, the efficiency head only is 90% for electricity. So that's why the price of head only is very cheap or cheapest. And the expensive in here is gas fire or gas cycle why because gas cycle get rid of excess heat when and this way increasing the cost and the last analysis is the nuclear fuel giving the stable price maybe it because the nuclear fuel is cheap but of course the nuclear nuclear fuel is cheap and only needed in small quantities quantities okay this is about the running time comparison in second we could see in here the combine and combine uh, only need one second, but for head only need so much time. I mean the longest time in this one too. And it on my in my opinion, because when we run the head only cycle, there is in the last process or when the laptop or computer uh, pretty tired. Okay, this is about water cost. Of course, uh, this is in dollar per cubic, and, and again, the stable and the stable and cheap price is the nuclear fire again. Mm, the interesting thing is about the head only. Look at this one, this one, and this one. Remember that in the electricity cost, as I said before, the cheapest price is at head only, but in the water comparison, head only uh, for water cost is very high, I mean, very uh, expensive cost. Uh, why this is could be happening? Because the efficiency 19% is only for electricity, not for water process and price. Accordingly, the water price is expensive and need more energy to process from the steam to be fresh water in the real nuclear reactor. Okay, this is about the lifetime for nuclear reactor in the range 50 until 60 years and for gas is 25 years and the coal, for the coal is 35 years. Okay, this one about the water production. This is the last one. For nuclear fuel, coal producing water until 
30, okay, until 30 uh, okay, cubic for, for every year, but for gas and for coal only 28. Uh, as I said before, the desalination process with nuclear fuel is the stable process and stable price. So that's why the efficiency for nuclear is around 50 until 60 percent then cool producing water more than gas or coal. Okay, now about the conclusion. First, we will talk about the electricity and second, the water and the last is about the lifetime. Okay, for the electricity, the cheapest price is head only power plant or in rupiah 272,59 rupiah or each kWh, KWH is kilowatt hour. And based on data from, data from PLN, if we make comparison from the nuclear, I mean, nuclear reactor price and the PLN price, uh, the people only have to pay around 10% from the PLN price. Okay, this is about the water cost. The cheapest price is the nuclear fired gas power plant or in rupiah, 2,699 uh, 2, for each cubic. And the last is about the last lifetime. The nuclear is the longest lifetime rather than gas on core because if we see the real nuclear reactor, we only have to refueling nuclear over one year. Okay, this is my references. Okay, I would like to thankful for to my lecture first to Sir Dewi Irwanto as my nuclear lecture and to Sir Harry Mardika for who teach me in this class and he has given advice so much to my paper. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Nazla, for uh, delivering a presentation related to the pressured water reactor uh, for uh, for nuclear power plant. Uh, we have time for three questions for Nazla. Okay, uh, if if we, okay, so I have a question for Nazla. Uh, if the salinization is not a uh, part of the process, then would it be the price of electricity remain the same or it doesn't matter at all? I'm sorry, sir. Yes. My question is that uh, your uh, topic is about uh, desalination cost, right? So if yes, uh, if if we implement that, then uh, the um, the the electricity price will be much cheaper compared to the uh, price that is given from the uh, national electrical company, right? But yes. if we uh, don't have this process, the process of desalination, uh, would be the price remain the same or it will be much expensive or much cheaper? Do you have a thought about it? Okay. Uh, in my opinion, sir, for uh, in the real nuclear reactor is actually uh, should be talk about the desalination process because the nuclear reactor needs so much water so that's why the uh, fresh water is only the advantage from uh, I mean okay. advantage from the nuclear reactor the real nu nuclear reactor is not for for producing fresh water but for the electricity. Uh, but in the other side could be producing the water. Uh, so that's why, because nuclear reactor need so much water, uh, in the real, sir, do we say it in the nuclear 
class, of course, we will give the cheapest price and the electricity too. Okay, uh, so it is like so it is basically part of a nuclear uh, reactor scheme so that the cooling system will be provided from the interaction of the uh, reactor with the fresh water because we don't want any uh, salt particles uh, uh, stranded on the surface of the reactor itself. And so if we uh, doesn't implement or we if we didn't include desalination in our process, it means that we uh, make a potential, uh, we, we could make some kind of a damage due to the increase of salt uh, that is uh, attached to the body of the reactor so that uh, it basically will increase the cost, okay, increase the cost, uh, and then somehow it will also uh, uh, make the electricity price a little bit uh, more expensive due to the maintenance uh, cost due to the uh, creation of salt inside of the reactor. Uh, okay, um, is there any question from the audience? One more question. If there's no one, I want to ask a question yes. to Nasla. Yes, yes. Um, Nasla, do you think that in Indonesia specifically, this this kind of technology will emerge because, um, because uh, as far as I know that uh we we are we are pretty abundant of fresh water right so do you still think that this can be implemented in indonesia someday or do you think that that it's more viable as just a side uh a side thing beside electricity okay thank you for the question christopher yes uh, yesterday from the class nuclear again with sir zaki Soud, uh he said uh, because i asked the same question like you. And he said that the nuclear reactor, uh, he said that nuclear reactor should be, will be implemented in Kalimantan, but because it's not easy to get, uh, I'm sorry, sir, uh, to be jakan in English. Policy. Yes, because the policy of nu uh, reactor, nuclear reactor is so hard in Indonesia. And because the, nuclear reactor, uh, we do the work together with Russia as the best nuclear, uh, okay, about nuclear, and so too far away, so far away from Russia to bring the real nuclear reactor from Russia to Indonesia. So that's why still not, not the, not the continue the nuclear reactor for this year, but Someday, maybe I believe the nuclear reactor could be implemented in Indonesia. All right, all right. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nasla, and thank you, Christopher, for uh, the uh, questions. So that uh, I would like to move on to the fifth, oh, sorry, the sixth presenter, which is Hansel Kane. Yes, sir. Could you hear my voice? Yes. And I would like to thank uh, Nazla as well uh, after she done her presentation. Um, Hmm. Wait, sir. Uh, yeah, it's loading. Yes, the loading is kind of laggy. So, yeah. Is the anim and is the animation laggy, like sir? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Hari Mahardika and all of my friends. Today, I'm gonna present about human detection with mobile robots. 
mainly focused on machine learning and image processing. In a site after a disaster, a building is typically unstable and, and are really prone to changes. That's why it is very difficult, very difficult and very dangerous for a rescue worker to search and rescue victims in an unstable building. This is when mobile robot could come into play and could be utilized because the limited resource of humans. Mobile robot could also be used to enhance the process of search and rescue process. In this case, I'm gonna use um, image processing from thermal images. There are four sensors that, that I'm gonna use. There are, there are four main sensors. The first one is the thermal camera, the infrared camera. The second one is a distance sensor. And the third one is GPS and acceleration sensor. The thermal camera works with the distance sensor. From the image that is obtained by the thermal camera, we could calculate its intensity and we could obtain its sizes. From the GPS and accelerometer sensor, we could obtain the position of the robot. And with that position, we, we could determine where, where the victim is located. So we could report back to the team. Machine learning, uh, in this case, a convolutional neural network is probably on the rise right now because it, it excels in image processing, especially object recognition and in classifying images. In this case, I'm gonna use mobile net SSD because it is very lightweight and very suitable for embedded system. There are more sophisticated methods like retina net or YOLO, for example, but if it is run on Raspberry Pi, the frame rate will drop significantly. That's why in this case, I'm gonna use mobile net SSD. And also between architecture, usually there are trade-offs between latency and accuracy. MAPs in terms of image processing. Sorry, sorry. Can the lady? It's very laggy. Very laggy. Um, very laggy. Hold up. Um, yeah. So the uh, it's because I'm using too many moving images, probably. Uh, so yeah, the. CNN network basically have, have three main parts, which is the input, the hidden, and the output part. It's a very simplified version of neural network. Usually the hidden layer isn't only one layer, but consists of, of thousands, probably thousands of layers. And the input in this case, in image processing, is the pixel intensity. And the hidden layer is probably, uh, is, is the weight. It's something that we could adjust in order to, for us to classify the image. And the output layer is typically the classifier image. Um, the output could determine whether an object is a human, for example, a cat or a dog, based on the feature that is extracted on the hidden layer. In this case, for example, in this very simplified case, is a binary classification between a dog and a cat. And, a cat. and in this case, it is a dog. There are main difference between thermal and RGB image. 
In thermal camera, basically it has only one channel, but in RGB image, it has three channels, which is red, green, and blue. There's a specific reason why I use thermal camera in human rescue. Because sometimes in a disaster site, human skin is not brown anymore. Sometimes it's covered in dust, for example, or it is covered in cloth or um, a fabric, for example. So RGB is not really reliable in that specific case. So that's why thermal is considered more reliable to RGB. And also about the image processing, thermal camera is actually easier and faster if compared to RGB image, because in thermal camera, it has only one channel, while in RGB image, it has three channels. So the weight and the adjustment. There's also a significant difference between thermal camera and RGB image especially in, um, in everyday camera. Thermal camera have a very low resolution if compared to RGB image. In this case, I'm gonna use Lepton 160 pixel time, times 120 pixel. This is very low resolution if compared to say a webcam, for example. But thermal and RGB image could be used to detect human, like in on the right. As you can see, it could detect humans walking on the street. Um, the second one, after the robot has finally determined whether an object is a human or non-human, then we could utilize the MPU accelerometer module. In this case, we obtain the acceleration and we integrate it once to obtain the speed, and we integrate it twice to obtain the position. Of course, there are many errors in integrating acceleration into position because oh, it involves two integration process. But we could usually calibrate it using using a reference point. So in this case, GPS module is used to calibrate the MPU sensors. So yeah, this is the prototype of the robot. It is actually um, derived from a Clover robot, which is uh, from a for foreigner concept. And we try to integrate machine learning uh, into this robot. So the first one that I'm gonna do is human detection, which I already explained uh, about, about that in using mobile net SSD. The second one is position determination using um, MPU and GPS sensor. And the third one is reporting back. I'm gonna use an ROS operating system to report back to the team and probably use mo module LoRa or uh, SIM card module. So the conclusion is image processing is useful to detect human after disaster, location of robot, could be determined using MPU and GPS, and mobile robot could be used in search and rescue process. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Okay, thank you, Hansel, uh, for giving us a presentation related to the uh, human detections uh, using image processing. Uh, we have time for two questions for uh, Hansel. If there's any from the audience. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Yes. Sure, so sure. Uh, I assume this is your final project, is that correct? Yes. So my question is about the IR camera. So you're using IR camera, right? Yes, yes. So. 
uh, how do you deal with the very limited resolution of the IR camera? Because from what I've known, is it actually a restrictive? There is actually a restriction on IR camera which prohibit IR camera to have a high resolution image. So it is actually below 100 times 100 pixel from what I have known. So it's the image will be very very uh, very very undetailed. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah, it is a major limitation in thermal camera. Yes, of course. But the major concern is probably about the price. As the resolution increased, the price increases exponentially. So the 160 pixels times 120 pixels costs around 3 million rupees. So there are available. Um, much higher resolution, of course, but the price is just so staggeringly high and it is not really suitable for a mobile robot. So yeah, with this low resolution camera, we, we actually have limited distance. In RGB camera, for example, we could view a humans in a hundred meters, but in thermal cameras, we, we cannot do that. Probably just for 50 meters for object recognition in humans. So yeah, that, that, that's a major limitation. Resolution is the major limitation. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Is that answered the question? Uh, yeah. Thank you for answering. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question? Okay. okay any uh, other question from the audience? I want to ask. Yes. So my name is Johnson. Uh, I want to ask. Uh, so sometimes uh, in the building, when we use, uh, when disaster happens, uh, there are some maybe hit. Uh, like another heat source, like maybe pipe gas or anything else. Uh, how can your robot uh, like differentiate between another heat source with the human? Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you for the question, Johnson. Yeah, it also have been addressed in some papers, especially related to fire department search and rescue. So, so it's not natural disaster, a, a fire department paper. It, it also have some difficulties, especially if fire exists. Fires uh, will cover the heat in human because fire typically has much higher um, uh, heat, much higher temperature if compared to human. But if there are no presence of fires, for example, like um, a dust or a heat, heat vapor for, or something, we could still analyze the image using uh, only the shape, you know, the, the shape of the image. Intensity might vary or clouded by various factors like dust or cloth, for example. But the like, like, like a ham, it, it still has the shape of a ham. Even though the intensity varies you know, from very low to very high, if there are something covering, but yeah, it's, it's, it's still possible even, even if those factors do exist, it's still possible to detect human in those conditions, even though there are many limitations, of course. Is that answer the question? I think it's all. Thank you. Okay. okay. Is there... okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Johnson, and also Kevin, who asked uh, questions on um, Hansel's presentation. So with that, we can move on to our uh, last presenter of today's session, which is Aurelio Deandra. And I would like to yes, thank sorry. Hansel for giving a uh, interesting presentation related to human detection, uh, especially when disaster happens. Okay. All right, uh, is it uh, already feasible? Yes, processing, yes. 
Uh, it is feasible okay. at, at the moment. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, wait. Hold up. Uh, All right, uh, hello. I, I guess I, get, I have some technical difficulties. I apologize. Okay. <clears throat> okay, good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Morning. Good morning, Mr. Harry and uh, classmates. Uh, today, uh, I would like to present you about my project, the application of sonification as an alternative to the accessibility of astronomical images for the visual impact. Uh, a bit of introduction first. My name is Aurelio Deandra uh, with the student number 1031715. And I am from uh, Astronomy Study Program. Oh, okay. <clears throat> first of all, let me explain uh, about the visual senses in astronomy. Astronomy as a science relies heavily on visual perception. For example, the, the act of observation uh, of sky observation, there is stargazing uh, either with uh, with the help of tools such as telescope or without tools with naked eye. Uh, the astronomical images such as uh, in figure one, the images titled Hubble captures view of Mystic Mountain from NASA <clears throat> and the data visualization to help with the data processing. For example, in figure two, this is the visualization of a light curve of an eclipsing binary star system. Therefore, uh, with the heavy reliance on visual sense, astronomy can be difficult to be grasped by, vis by the visual is impaired. But that does not mean that efforts have, uh, but effort never been uh, never made to communicate astronomy for uh, to the visually impaired. For example, is the tactile universe the project from Institute of Cosmological and Gravitation from the University of Portsmouth. They make the 3D printer model of, for example, galaxy, quasar, and um, to communicate such uh, such astronomical uh, astronomical objects for the visually impaired. Uh, this project relies heavily on tactile perception, which is the sense of touch. First of all, why? <laughs> Why do I? Uh, why do we have to communicate astronomy for to the visually impaired? I would like to introduce you to Wanda Elias Merced. She is a visually impaired astronomer. With uh, one of the one of the paper is the sonification of uh, astronomical data from 2011, uh, and I quote her uh, interview, uh, her presentation on that, which is. Science is for everyone, it belongs to the people, and it has to be available for everyone, regardless of their limitations and disability. First of all, what is sonification? Sonification is the inter uh, interpretation of data in audio form. For the for eyes, it is analogous to visualization. The one of the most well-known is example of data sonification is the Geiger counter. The ticking noise of the Geiger counter uh, help to detect radiation in a given area. Uh, now the problem is how is the image accessibility for the visually impaired? There are available screen reader programs. Screen reader, screen reader programs describe scenes and images with words, with human words. For example, the Envision app. This, uh, in these images, uh, in this image, uh, the Envision app detects detects a plan, a pot of plan. So they uh, they will communicate that there is a, a pot of plan with human words, but. This limitation might be proved difficult to convey information, to convey abstract information such as the, uh, let's just say how the, how does a, a, a person who never see a galaxy know what a galaxy is? I propose that 
sonification could be used as an alternative to bypass the need of describing scenes and images with words. But uh, this is the uh, this is the difference about astronomy for scientists and for the general public. Scientists deal with data theories and calculation. For example, uh, the paper I mentioned earlier, sonification of astronomical data. They use the program Exonify to uh, oh yeah, to sonify the curve, uh, the light curve of X Hydrae and the X seventeen Halloween storm. But for the general public, mostly they consume astronomical images as a work of art. They do not deal with data whatsoever. Therefore, this is comes with an idea. How uh, how about we sonify existing astronomical images? There are uh, in my research, I found that there are two approach of image sonification. The first is color approach, and the second is shape approach. The color approach, uh, the color approach, might be more intuitive to us to the people without visual impairment. Uh, the image shown, figure seven, is the Newton's uh, correlation of color and musical interface. <clears throat> they, uh, these images are recreated using Adobe Photoshop program, and it is, uh, it is first shown in, the, uh, in Newton's first book, uh, the second part, experiment seven. <clears throat> the experiment is given shown. There, are, uh, there, are, there is a light, a light source uh, dispersed with the help uh, dispersed with the help of a uh, prism to create a color spectrum. The color spectrum then uh, measured measured the distance from the point to x. What is interesting is the the ratio of the distance between the uh, the color. Uh, the color deficit and the line GX, which is the longest line, matches perfect uh, matches perfectly with the with the inverse of the interval. With the inverse of the interval, with uh, the tuning system just intonation in music theory. <clears throat> uh, if the uh, if the if the collection of notes is played, they will create what is called a Dorian scale in music theory. Uh, admittedly, it is a modern Dorian, modern Dorian scale. So uh, Newton, uh, Newton in, his, in his book described it, describes it as a diatonic scale. But uh, what is interesting is actually it is a Dorian scale with a scale with such uh, no, interval. Uh, this is the difference with the shape. Correlation of shape and touch is much more intuition than shape and sound. For example, the tactile universe, a project I mentioned earlier, they use touch senses. <clears throat> and uh, another example is the Braille alphabet. But it is not to say that there, uh, there aren't any efforts to try to uh, correlate the shape and sound. Such example is can be seen in media art phenomenon. Uh, the figure eight is the, an example of media art. This is a uh, media art of uh, outer space by uh, Zulubo Productions. They created using the Audacity program. Uh, what is shown is meant to be an image of an ellipse and a circle. Uh, intended to recreate, to recreate um, what is it called a ring planet such as Saturn. So, what is the chosen approach? What shall this project use? Uh, for that, I could uh, uh, Garg defined, uh, Garg stated in his paper in 2019, that for people without visual impairment, shape and color are processed simultaneously. But the project is focused on the visual impaired. I've done some interview in 
uh, in one of the uh, one of the community of visual impaired person in Cimahi. Uh, they stated that shape perception is more important than color perception because the concept of shape is easier to grasp than the concept of color for the visual impaired. Therefore, uh, for this project, I chose the shape approach. Uh, but this is the thing. There are actually a much more ideal approach if we uh, with two sen uh, with using two senses tactile and tactile and visual sense uh, tactile and auditory sense the auditory sense convey the information of color and the tactile sense convey the information of touch uh, the information of shape but the downside is we need a, a direct we need direct approach if we intend to use tactile senses so uh, in this type of uh, pandemic it is actually not that possible to convey uh, to convey direct uh, touch senses especially because uh, visual uh, physical contact must be minimalized at all costs and the other thing is uh, to the touch senses, they cannot. We cannot uh, communicate. Uh, we can communicate with the touch method virtually. So, what is the goal of my project? My goal is to create an algorithm and program which satisfies this key performance indicator. The first is the algorithm is able to create melodies for specific shapes, and the second. The algorithm is responsive to the transformation done by the shape. To, to satisfy the first key performance indicator, I intend to use the concept of leitmotif in music theory. Darcy defines leitmotif as a short musical phrase that was given a semantic content by its composer. Leitmotif is usually connected to the soundtrack in storytelling media such as films and theater plays. The semantic concept stated is the component of the story, for example, a certain themes, character, or events. Without any semantic concept, content, we can define motif. The motif itself it is, is defined as a short melodic phrase. Uh, I shall give two examples. Oh, hold up, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, all right. I shall give a YouTube example of a song clip. Both songs are soundtrack played in a story media called Andra. This is the first clip called Strom und Drang by Marvin Kopp. Oh, hold up. And the second one uh, is called The Other Tag Wider Let's by Martin Kopp also. Wait. All right, I clip the same melodic phrase which is played in both songs. Uh, in the storytelling media, the phrase is associated with a character. Therefore, the phrase can be called as a leitmotif. With this concept, I come up with an idea to associate a certain shape with certain leitmotif. For example, like this. <clears throat> Suppose this is an image. The circle played by itself sounds like this. And the square. If we sonify the whole image, this, this melodic phrase will play. There is the word I called a shape leitmotif. Oh. Uh, sadly, Aurelio, uh, we can't yes. hear the sound. <laughs> or is that only oh. me? Yeah. Uh, yes. So actually, it's like uh, the the share screen. You not uh like check the share sound. So yeah. Actually, it's uh, okay. okay. Just continue. It. Oh. Uh, I apologize. I apologize. Okay, uh, sir, can uh, you have can two minutes to conclude? Yeah, you have okay. two minutes to conclude your presentation. Okay, 
uh, the second uh, is the shape distortion represented uh, in the change of shape play motif. Uh, for example, if the musical phrase uh, like in the circle is given by a, uh, for example, a, a second or so, the ellipse width can be inferred as a uh, as an ex, uh, as an extended silver uh, extended uh, circle can be given as like for example uh, one and a half second or so. Now, uh, I must admit that this is uh, an ongoing project. Uh, I I am still I am still working on the algorithm and the program to satisfy both key performance indicator. So, but uh, I believe that. Uh, this this can be done. Uh, this can be done, but uh, yeah, uh, this project can be done, and I hope that this project can be useful for the communication to the visually impaired. Oh, hold, hold up. Okay, uh, and this is the references I use for the for this uh, presentation, and. There is all uh, for my presentation. I'm sorry if uh, any conveniences occur, such as the inability to play sounds. And there is all. Uh, good morning and thank you. Uh, and uh, if there's any question, feel free to ask. Okay, we have time for one question for Aurelio. Uh, if there's no one to want to uh, to give a question, I have a question for Aurelio, perhaps. Yes, please. Um, so, Aurelio, uh, do you think the works that you are done is more uh, is it it is more astronomical or is this the field in um, in arts? Because uh, as far as I um, when 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 I hear you, uh, I suddenly uh, think that. Perhaps this is this is suita more suitable if we go to the art approach than the astronomical approach. What do you think about that? Okay, uh, actually, there is the question I have while while working on this project. Uh, I conclude that uh, it is uh, a three multidisciplinary field. Uh, one of them is uh, one of them is uh, actually music theory. The music theory is uh, one of the uh, disciplinary field needed to uh, what is that to uh, to work in this project uh, but uh, there is the uh, the astronomical aspect itself is I use the uh, I use the uh, astronomical images to convert it to uh, to a sound uh, the astronomical aspect lies in the purpose of this project. I uh, I give the, this project a sole purpose to communicate astronomical images through uh, through the use of sound. So there is the uh, I believe the astronomical aspect of my project. Uh, is that uh, answer okay. satisfied? Um, yeah, pretty satisfied. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, with that question, I guess we already done with today's session. Thank you, Aurelio, and uh, everybody Thank who you, attend Thank the you, first session uh, of uh, scientific communication uh, final presentation. Uh, we're going to meet uh, with you again on Thursday for the second session. We already have the list of people who are going to present on Thursday. So uh thank you all for attending the class we'll see you again on the second session on thursday okay thank you all. okay thank you very much sir thank you very much everybody